swing into our first story here, which is one people may have seen something about, and that is the uh, scandal roiling the city of Los Angeles. And, you know, it's gotten all the way up to President Biden in terms of politicians in Los Angeles who were caught on a hot mic saying some extraordinarily racist things towards black people, towards indigenous people in Mexico, people from the state of Oaxaca. I mean, really many more people. I mean, some some really disgusting things. And we are very honored to be joined as we continue with this story by Dr. Melina Abdullah, who's co-founder of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, an organizer with Black Lives Matter Grassroots, and a professor of Pan-African Studies at Cal State LA. Dr. Abdullah, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, you know, the pleasure is all ours. And I, I think that you know, this scandal has really reverberated all around the country. I mean, it hits on, you know, so many different elements, uh, you know, of of the relationships between the black community, the Latino community, issues of, of gerrymandering. I mean, there's so much there. But I guess my first question for you is, I mean, how surprised were you to hear that this happened? Does it feel that this is indicative of, of a broader a trend or, you know, just a handful of people with racist, racist ideas uh, airing them when they thought they were in private? Yeah, um, I think I was surprised that it was leaked. Um, we know that anti-Blackness in the city of Los Angeles, but also all across the country, runs deep. You know, that's what Black Lives Matter is about, is about pushing back against anti-Blackness, state-sanctioned violence that includes the killings of our people at the hands of police, but also includes violence like trying to strip away the Blackest city council district in the city of all of its resources and assets. It also includes the undermining of Black political power and the denigration of Black organizing. One of the things I think that we've seen in media is a real zeroing in on the horrific things that Nuri Martinez, the now former um, city council president, said about the two-year-old Black son of another city council member, um, when I don't even want to repeat what she said, but um, they were terrible things, especially to be hurled um, in the direction of a two-year-old baby. That I don't even want to call Jacob a child because at two years old, you're not even a child yet, mm -hmm. right? Um, people have been zeroing in on that, and they should. And they should also be looking at what Kevin DeLeon, who's hanging on to his city council seat despite calls for him to step down, what he said about Black movement how he said it's all the Wizard of Oz and there's really only 25 Black people yelling. We should be offended and outraged and we should take action. Um, and we have been taking action to get all four of those who were involved in this conversation um, to step down from their posts. So we are two down, two to go, and we intend to get them all out of those positions. Finally, I'll just offer in this long response to your short question, um, I'll just offer that it's not just those four, right? That those four are actually considered to be the most tame. You know, they. I had drinks more than once with Nuri Martinez, mm -hmm. right? Ron Herrera, the former president of the LA County Federation of Labor, is sadly probably the best we got in terms of labor leadership. He has black grandchildren. Right. Mm -hmm. Kevin DeLeon with a student in my class. Gil Cedillo has a um, relationship with black organizing that dates back to the 1960s. So these aren't four like rampant racists. Right. In fact, when we think about city council, the person who just replaced Nuri Martinez as acting city council president, his name is Mitch O'Farrell, and he's actually far more overtly and blatantly racist than Nuri Martinez is. And so what we're demanding is a fundamental cultural shift. This is a time for overhaul. This is a time to demand racial justice that begins with the removal of these four, but also gets into questions like policies and redistricting and how these kinds of spaces of power are built in the first place. Mm. You know, I think that that's so important to, you know, bring it to the big picture element of this, which is the structural and cultural issues we're speaking about here. And I, you know, in, in reading the various articles written about this, um, I found this really 
it, this really important uh, part, and this is from the New York Times. I just want to read these couple of sentences because I think it speaks to that structural element of this anti-Black racism being used to maintain power and to take power. So it says, in the meeting, which was secretly recorded, the three council members and Ms. Mr. Herrera spoke about strategies for ensuring that council districts would be redrawn so that Latino leaders would have key blocks of voters within their districts, as well as, quote, assets like airports that can enhance an office holder's political influence and fundraising ability. And then it goes on to speak about the complaints about a lack of political representation for Latinos and considering ways to carve up districts historically represented by black council members. So two things about that spoke to me is just the sort of like underlying corruption here, right? It's like legalized corruption, but the underlying corruption here of trying to use racism to make money for specific individuals in positions of power, and as well as doing it by, of course, going after specifically black districts. Not that like, you know, you should be going after like Asian districts, but just the specifically going after the weakest districts, because we're talking about America here and in America, of course, black districts are often in the in the weakest positions. But I'm curious if you could speak to that sort of corrupt structural element that, like you mentioned, is not really going to change with the people that have replaced uh, the person who stepped down? Right. So they specifically went after not just the three blackest districts in the city. So there's 15 council districts in Los Angeles. Three of them have been historically held by black council members. One of them is the blackest district in the city. That's the one that um, was targeted the most. Um, that's the eighth council district. They stripped it of all of its assets. There was an uproar um, in black Los Angeles where we were pushing for those resources, for those assets to be restored to the eighth district. And one of the things that was said in a city council meeting on Tuesday, um, one of the redistricting commissioners who's black and who's um, really down with movement, his name is uh, Pastor Eddie Anderson. He said that as they were um, meeting around how to redistrict the city, which happens only every 10 years, right? That one day this group of people just showed up with what he called mystery maps right? Now we know how those mystery maps came to be. It's really important, as you're pointing out, that we understand that institutional and structural racism is there. And there are individuals that are behind those institutions and structures. It's not that those institutions and structures only churn on their own. They do churn on their own, right? But they're also helped along by individuals who have a vested interest in making sure that they exploit black neighborhoods, exploit black people, and really minimize um, the prospects for black power. And that's what we're seeing happening here. You know, one of the things that that also makes me think of in a way, especially the power element, was just seeing sort of that, not only the outrage that was expressed at the city council meetings they've attempted to have so far, but really who was in the room. I mean, obviously BLM was there, LA Tenants Union was there. I mean, it actually seemed like a very similar group of people that I have seen being outraged about so many different issues, the affordable housing crisis, racist criminalized policing, the you know ridiculous criminalization of homelessness. I, I mean, it really thought, it, to me, it almost looked like the real sort of, you know, quote unquote, multiracial working class based coalition that wants to change things versus the fake kind of lip service version very much on display. So it almost felt like a battle between two visions of what Los Angeles can and should be. That's exactly right. Your assessment is spot on, right? Um, we want to be clear that you know, the anti-Blackness, anti-indigeneity, um, the anti-poor sentiment that was expressed by those four is what's held by many, many folks in the political class, right? But what moves on the streets is really a space of solidarity. So every Wednesday for 87 weeks now, we've been protesting the Los Angeles Police Protective League and all police associations that bully and bribe elected officials, including the three that were part of the scandal, right? Um, and when you go out to those demonstrations, 
you see black folks and brown folks and indigenous folks and Asian folks and radical white folks all there in solidarity. You hear families like Waukesha Wilson's family and Sky Young's family and John Horton's family standing with Vanessa Marquez family, standing with Melly Corrado's family and Anthony Vargas's family. So you're absolutely right. There are two approaches. Let me also offer some hope that, you know, when we look at this last election and when we look at what people will vote on in November, it's not the timid, it's not the um, ones who express coalition in name only that won the primaries, right? Who won in the primaries are those who have a shared vision of a city and of a world where everybody has housing, where everybody has, you know, um, basic things like mental health resources, right? We got to be clear that Kenneth Mejia, who's running for city council, is with us every Wednesday saying defund the police. That Fassel Gill, who's running for city attorney, has pledged to investigate not just these four, but every single policy that they've touched if he wins as city attorney. That Gil Cedillo was on his way out, one of the three council members was on his way out anyway because he lost his seat to a radical abolitionist Latina named Ionisis Hernandez, right? And so we should be hopeful and we should use this moment to push for more. Um, finally, I'll just offer that um, Sunday, the tapes came out. Monday, 68 Black um, organizers got together on a marathon call and came up with very clear demands. Those can be found at tinyurl.com slash BlackLA 2022. They included everything from getting those four out of office or out of their seats to removing police associations from the County Federation of Labor. On that call was, of course, as you mentioned, the usual folks like Black Lives Matter, like LA Can, like the LA Black Worker Center. But also on the call was pretty much every pastor in the Black pastor in the city. Mm. Los Angeles Metropolitan Churches was on there. The NAACP was on there. Southern Christian Leadership Conference was on there. And so I think that this moment of outrage has also forced those who don't want to be tied to that political class to embrace vision and to move left. Mm -hmm. Well, it's always good to have a note of hope. And I think out of all of these controversies, sometimes they can be the most generative types of moments. But Dr. Abdullah, as always, we're really honored to have you give us some of your time and analysis here on the Freedom Side. Thank you so much.